Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Excel International GCSE Biology Paper 1B for June 2022. This is the part one video. I will do two more videos and put the links in the description box. Let's begin with question one. It says, the human body has different hormones that are produced by endocrine glands. The diagram labels some of the endocrine glands in the body. So here they have labeled the pancreas. We can see the adrenal gland. Here we can see the ovary as well as the testes. Then they go on to ask, which gland produces insulin? Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas. As we know, the pancreas is both exocrine and endocrine. It's exocrine because it produces some digestive enzymes, while it's endocrine for the production of hormones like insulin as well as glucagon. So the answer here should be an A, that is the pancreas. Then the next part says which gland produces progesterone. Progesterone is a hormone produced among females. It is produced by the ovaries, so it should be gland D, and uh, the answer here should be a D. Moving on, it says the human body has two systems of communication. There is the nervous and hormonal. Students research the speed of nervous and hormonal communication. They find this data. Hormones travel at a speed of 420 centimeters per minute. Nerve impulses travel at a speed of 55 meters per second. Determine the ratio of the speed of nervous communication to the speed of hormonal communication. And they want you to give your answer in the form of N to 1. So I went with the information given and I said for hormones, the speed given is 420 centimeters per minute. And we know the other words meters per second. So I wanted to convert this to meters per second. 420 centimeters is 4.2 meters, while one minute is 60 seconds. When you divide, you get 0 0.07 meters per second, and the other is 55. The next step is to find the ratio, which is 55 to 0 0.07, which is 78.5, uh, 785.7 to 1, and then 786 to 1, giving us 786 to 1 as the ratio we were looking for. The next part says, describe three other differences between the nervous system and the hormonal system. Remember, they've given us one difference, which is speed. We have seen one is faster while the other is a little bit slower. So here we can see the other parts I was going to describe are number one, nerve impulses work on a specific location while hormones work on different locations. One thing we need to know is nerve impulses are specific. They are not widespread or the, the effects from nerve impulses are not widespread while the effects from hormones are widespread. Taking an example of the hormone adrenaline, it works on multiple organs. It can work on the heart, it works on the muscles, and so on. So that is being widespread. The next part is the response from nerve impulses is usually short-lived. It means after the effect has been done, you will not feel the rem remnants of the effects from the nerve impulses, or after its job or its function has been finished, you will not feel the effects or the after effects within the body, while the hormone will remain in the body for a little bit longer in comparison to the nerve impulses. So we can say that hormones are long-lasting or long-lived in comparison to the nerve impulses. The next, nerve impulses use neurons as a mode of communication or transportation of the nerve impulses, while hormones travel through plasma, this is through the blood. Next, nerve impulses are electrical, while hormones are chemical. So these four are distinguishing in addition to the one we saw about speed. This brings us to the end of question one. We can move on to question two. Question two, biologists classify organisms in two different groups. One group of organisms is fungi. Complete the passage about fungi by writing a suitable word or words in each blank space. Fungi do not carry out photosynthesis. Their body is usually organized into a mycelium made from thread-like structures called hyphae. Fungal cell walls are made of chitin. Fungi feed by extracellular secretion of enzymes onto the food material and absorption of the organic products. This is known as saprotrophic nutrition. So these are the possible answers there. Then they go on to say, a student investigates the effect of temperature on the rate of anaerobic respiration in yeast. The student measures the rate of gas produced in centimeters cubed per minute. The graph shows their results. So we can see here there is a rate of gas produced in centimeters cubed per minute as the temperature increases. Of course, this is a typical curve. You can see as the temperature increases, the rate of gas produced increases until a specific temperature, and then it begins to decrease 
as enzymes are denatured. Here we can see this is a biological process that leads to the production of a specific gas. Anaerobic respiration is the process and the gas produced could be CO2. So let's continue to the next part. Here they ask, name the gas produced by yeast during anaerobic respiration. Of course, this is carbon dioxide gas. Then they're going to ask, explain the effect that increasing temperature has on the rate of gas produced by the yeast. Here we have to look back at our graph. You can see as the temperature increases, the rate of gas produced also increases until a specific temperature about that, and then it goes down. So we are going to explain the effect of increasing temperature on the rate of gas production by yeast. So I said, increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of molecules. This is the key part. When the temperature is increased, the molecules will have a higher amount of energy within them, and therefore they'll be moving at a higher speed, uh, increasing their chances of having successful collision between the enzyme as well as the substrate. So here, both the enzyme and the substrate have more frequent collisions, increasing the rate of reaction as well as more CO2 production uh, within that specific time. When the temperature increases above the optimum, so this first part is explaining the part of how it increases until that maximum. So when the maximum is reached or the optimum, so increasing the temperature above the optimum, the enzymes begin to denature and the rate of reaction will decrease. Therefore, the rate at which carbon dioxide is produced also decreases as well. Remember, this question was asking you to explain the effect of increasing the temperature on the rate of production of a gas. So the higher the temperature, the higher the rate of gas production until the optimum temperature is reached. Beyond the optimum temperature, the higher the temperature, the lower the rate of gas production. So the next part here says, describe how the student could measure the rate of gas production in this experiment. You're measuring the volume of gas produced. What you need to do is use a syringe to collect the gas within a specific period of time. And then you can use this equation of rate is equal to volume of CO2 produced over the specific time in which that volume was produced. That will give you the ideal rate. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's go to question three. Question three, vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that a person can force out of their lungs in one breath. The graph shows the relationship between vital capacity and age for a large number of people. So here we can see the graph shows us the median vital capacity in liters and then the age. So we can see initially as the age increases, the median vital capacity increases until a specific age. It becomes uh, somehow constant and then it begins to decrease as age increases. So here they say the vital capacity plotted is the median value for each age. Said what is meant by the term median. Here we can see the median is the middle value of a collected set of data. So you have a collected set of data, the middle number as you arrange them in increasing order, that is going to be the median. And then the next part they ask, give a reason why the median is used rather than the mean. Using a mean can distort the results most so if the highest and the lowest number are farther apart. So to make it more representative, the results from each, like in this case, the results in each age must have a wider range, meaning maybe they had, like, since they, they're working with different ages, maybe the median or the values from the, the people who are younger and the people who are older had a very big gap. So it will not be representative enough to use the mean, so they chose to use the median. So I said results from each age must have had a wider gap or wider ranges, that is the highest minus lowest. So to reduce the effect of these extreme values, it will have to use, that the mean would have created, we would have to use the median. And again, remember, if you have a very big difference between the lowest and the highest value, using a mean will distort the values. It, will, it may not be representative enough. Let's take an example. If you have one value at 100, another value may be at 1, and another value may be at, an, at uh, less than 90, another at 20. If we are to use the mean, the mean is going to come to about a specific value. Let me see here. Uh, this could be, let me use this as 10. The mean could come, now let me change this. I want to create something that can come like 50. So 100, maybe here we have uh, a 0. Median, let me, this is just any value. And then we have a 90, and then we have a 10. 
If we calculate this, the median is going to be about 50. But among the values we worked with, there was no 50 as a representative value. So that may be misleading if we are using the mean. So that is something I wanted to show along. Sometimes the mean may not be representative enough more. So if the values are farther apart from each other. So a mean can be representative if the values are kind of close and the deviation or standard deviation is not that wide. So let's continue. Here they say describe the relationship between vital capacity and age shown by the graph. From the graph, we can see that as age increases, vital capacity increases steeply, that is initially, up to about 23 years of age. Again, to take you back, you can see this is about, from my estimation, uh, it's about 23 years of age, about this point here. So vital capacity steeply increases to about 23 years of age, then it becomes somehow constant before it begins to decrease uh, as we can see there. So I say it then levels off until 25 years, and finally it decreases at a constant rate after 25 years. The next part says, explain why vital capacity changes with age. Now vital capacity, remember, it's about how much air is going to be breathed out from the body. So it means the lung capacity is going to change over periods of time, and that can affect how vital capacity is going to be. So I said, it increases steeply up to about 23 years because the body size and the chest cavity increases. Remember, people are growing, they're becoming, uh, the, the body is changing. So even their lung capacity increases or the chest cavity becomes bigger, being able to take up more volumes of air. So then a little, it's going to have a little change until 25 years from 23 to 25 because growth is going to be slowed until it stops. Then after 25 years, there is going to be a decrease because the lungs are no longer as elastic as they used to be. Sometimes the intercostal muscles are not going to, they're going to be a little bit weakened. So the changes to the body after 25 years will affect how much air somebody can hold in in order to release, out, release it out when required. So vital capacity is going to be greatly affected or, uh, based on somebody's age. Next, they say, Edge is not the only variable that can change vital capacity. Give two other variables that can affect a person's vital capacity. If somebody is sick, uh, sicknesses like asthma, uh, bronchitis, emphysema can affect. Somebody could be, this could be a genetic condition. It could be when somebody is pregnant or somebody smokes. Uh, the difference between females and male. Of course, males are going to have a different vital capacity and females are going to have a different one even when they are the same, same size as well as the same age. Another thing could be due to pollution. Exposure to pollutants can greatly affect your vital capacity as well because it can affect how your lungs operate. The next part, describe a method you could use to demonstrate the effect of exercise on breathing rate of students. So here what we need to do is, we have to get the students we're going to work with. We have to ensure that these students are the same age, the same sex, and they have the same level of fitness. And then we have to give them the same kind of exercise. However, before they exercise, we have to let them sit and count the number of breaths the students make per minute when they are at rest. Then we give them the same exact exercise and count the number of breaths the student make per minute after the exercise. We have to make sure that we use more participants and be able to calculate the mean. So that is how you could do that. This part of being able to calculate the mean is about repetition. So you cannot use the same person multiple times. So get various people who are exactly the same age, same sex, same level of activity. Uh, they, are, they have the same level of fitness. And then uh, many of them, and then get their results and find the average. That would be representative enough. This brings us to the end of question three, as well as the end to this video. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.